Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now am found, was blind, but now I see. Great. Well, I'm here again with um, Flight Lieutenant Ray Harkinson. Um, Ray was in four squadron um, flying the Lynx which I'm sure many of you guys who were involved in fire force operations and external ops uh, uh, experienced. Um, uh, and uh, so Ray was really at the, at the tip of the spear and the sharp end of the war um, and was in the war really for quite a while. Certainly the, the, the hot part of the war from 1975 on to the end and, and beyond. Uh, he then left Rhodesia and, um, and started playing club rugby and became a salesman. And, uh, and a lot of you have often asked me, you know, what happened to these guys after the war? What, how did they, you know, adjust to life after the war? And we often only really cover, you know, the, the Rhodesian period. And then once it becomes Zimbabwe, we don't really talk about what happened afterwards. So I thought, you know, we would start uh, asking these guys to tell us a little, little bit about their later lives and how they adjusted to life after combat and, and uh, Civvy Street and what happened to them up until now, because, um, you know, some of them have got really interesting stories to tell about <laughs> what happened to them up until now. So, Ray, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you and tell us the exciting story of, of your life. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, John. I, I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to do this. You know, um, obviously our time, uh, I, I was born and bred in Rhodesia and our, our time living there and um, even being involved in the war, you know, it was a, an ex extremely special time for me. And when I think uh, it was literally six and a half years of my life <laughs> straight out of school that I went into into the war. And, um, it's you know, I, I've just turned 66, so it's literally a tenth of my life, um, which is not a, high, a huge portion, you know, but it had such an impact on my life, you know, in so many ways and very much molded who I am, you know. Um, uh, but as you say, you know, then then it was all over, and uh, you know, I stayed a year after uh, uh, Uncle Bob got in uh, into power, and uh, I pretty much made a decision uh, that uh, it wasn't for me, you know. So um, I moved my family. I had a young family, two two kids, uh, who were three and nine months at that time. And I moved to South Africa and I literally started again, John, I think uh, in the last interview, I told you, um, you know, this thing of series of life of ups and downs, you know, so from going, from being this very well known person um, and, you know, playing rugby for the country and all of that, um, I arrived in East London. And um, the reason I chose that is because our whole family basically decided to make the move at the same time. So my parents and my brother, who was a farmer, um, we all moved to East London at the same time. And I literally got my first job because I played rugby. You know, so a guy had said to me in the pub, oh, do you play rugby? And I said, yeah. He said, okay, I'll, I'll, I've got a job for you. <laughs> so uh, it was through that that I got my first job. Um, and uh, I think I told you off, off camera, John, that um, my job was selling um, jungle oats and black cat peanut butter and Induna millimeal. Yes, I literally started from scratch, you know. So, and the only reason I chose that is uh, because, um, you know, my wife had been through 
so much. Um, and I think that's something we may forget, you know, for us that we're in combat and um, uh, that we would just go off and go and do our job, you know, and we go and be gone for weeks and get back for a few days and gone again. And uh, But the impact on her as a wife and mom of our two kids was huge. And uh, so, you know, she just... Uh, kind of lay down the law <laughs> you know when the government talks you listen <laughs> and and she said no i don't want you joining the SAF now and uh, you're going through this wall again in the border war and um and i didn't have an inclination to be honest to do that so yeah so i had to brush up on my afrikaans um because uh, most of my clients were farmers in eastern cape you know and they had these little stores and um, so, yeah, so that's what I did. You know, I had to learn the ropes again of uh, selling and um, I enjoyed yeah. people anyway. So that's always been a priority for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I started playing rugby for that club. Uh, okay. Um, Ray, sorry, I just wanted to say, um, after we finished talking yesterday, we got onto the subject of PTSD. Um, yes. so I, I just wanted to remind you of that. I'm not saying you have to talk about that now, but um, no. if, you could, if you could come in, you know, I think that's a worthwhile topic to explore a little bit. Definitely. I'm, uh, I'll come into that very quickly, very soon, John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so, so I ended up um, uh, playing rugby for a club called Buffaloes, and, uh, and I threw myself, John, into those things. You know, I'd come from a place where I was intense. And I think all of us were, you know, so everything I did uh, back in Rhodesia was was uh, full out. So if I was uh, playing, <laughs> I played hard. When I uh, worked, I worked hard, you know, so I was the same on the rugby field. Um, although I'm quite small, um, I would take on guys way bigger than me. And I'm not saying that it's just how I was brought up, you know, it's like you just don't stand back. And um, and uh, so, yeah, um, that's how I was living my life. And uh, what happened is uh, with my wife and I, you know, we were trying to adjust to a new country. Um, for me, it's like there was a massive sense of loss. And I don't know that I realized it at the time, John, but the sense of loss of everything that I stood for, you know, everything that I fought for, everything that was my life for 27 years, you know, that literally had been... <laughs> you know, taken away from me, you know, uh, because of the circumstances. And I don't think I realized it then, but it definitely started to affect me. And, you know, having to start again afresh and not being known and, you know, um, psychologically, it definitely had an impact on me. And um, I, I don't think I recognized it, but what it did cause me to do is go even harder at what, what I was doing. So my, my rugby was, you know, as tough as it was before. And um, along with that, as was part of our Air Force life as well, was the drinking that came with that, you know, so as hard as I played, that's as hard as I partied afterwards in the pub, you know, and uh, my, my personality is, John, that I'm not the one that sits in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'd be the one up on the, on the, you know, on the bar counter and rah rah in and, you know, drinking from the winning cup and, you know, because competitiveness was still very much a part of me. And that that was my lifestyle, you know, and I just carried on doing that. Um, and then I, then I took up hockey, which I'd never played in my life before. And I made the first team, uh, a Buffalo's team, uh, hockey team as well. So what I was doing is four nights a week, I was at practice for rugby and then I'd play rugby on Saturday have a late night Saturday night and then Sunday morning I'd be back again playing hockey, you know, and then carrying on the party Sunday night, you know, so and at the time, John, I thought there's nothing wrong with this, you know, I was that's kind of, I think it for me it was a way of covering up uh, what I was missing and the loss that I was feeling, you know so I just kind of filled my life with whatever, mm -hmm. but it wasn't good on my family, you know, so here was my wife thinking, okay, things are going to change now, you know, I'm not going to the war anymore, and um, and yeah, and we kind of grew apart uh, for those three, those three years, first three years we were in South Africa, and, uh, you know, she was going to church, and I wasn't interested in church at all, you know, so we literally went in two different directions, and um, uh, eventually I got to a point, John, that I actually said to my wife, no, that's it, you know, I'm done. Uh, I, I, I don't want this responsibility anymore. And um, and I basically asked her for a divorce. Um, 
And, and you know, John, I, I, I honestly share this freely because, you know, at one stage, there was a time for all of us that we just didn't talk about this stuff. <laughs> you know, we talk about bries and, uh, and biltong and uh, rugby and all of that kind of stuff. But us as guys, we wouldn't express our emotions, you know, and we'd feel it, but we'd never tell anyone about it, you know. So, so yeah, so I got to that decision and, and she fought it, you know, she didn't want the divorce, you know, she, I, I, I was not a great husband, but, she, you know, she kind of, because of her faith, you know, she kind of thought, no, you know, she's going to fight this tooth and nail, you know, it's like, and eventually I got to a point that um, she, kind of like, I, the only way I can describe it, John, is that she, she got a word uh, that just said, be still and know that I'm God, you know, and so, she felt like whatever I say, she's just going to agree to that. So the next time uh, I asked her for a divorce, she she agreed. So within 10 days, uh, we got divorced. You know, she was looking after our two little kids. And uh, I went off and um, moved to Zanin. <laughs> it's a tiny little place, you know, in the old Eastern Charles Val. But uh, one of my mates from the Air Force, Glenn Pretorius, he was an ex uh five squadron pilot. So I went and stayed with Glenn and I kind of tried to put my life back together. And I thought, okay, now I've got my freedom and uh, I'll go back into flying, you know? So I went to go and um, do all my um, learning and uh, for, to get my commercial license. But um, uh, what happened, John, is basically my, literally my whole world fell apart <laughs> at that time. You know, everything that I thought, okay, now I've got the freedom to do what I want to do. And um, uh, my head was just in such a bad place. You know, now I kind of thought, okay, now I've lost absolutely everything. You know, so e everything that I had before, I'd lost that. And now I'd lost my family, you know. Um, I'd lost my job um, uh, trying to start a new. And I never kind of properly recovered from that and as a result of that you know I got to a point that I just thought well you know if this is life then I don't want anything to do with this and I, I actually did uh, try to end it all you know I won't go into all the um, <laughs> the what's the name of that but I did and um, uh, miraculously I survived that John and um, as a result of that uh, I, I literally felt uh, this is, you know, and again, I don't want to get spooky or spiritual about this, but I, I um, audibly heard a voice that it's never happened to me again. And it just said, get right with me and go back to your wife. And, you know, so um, I was kind of ready for it, you know. So we hear about people saying that they've, they found their faith uh, or, you know, they came to God or whatever you want to, uh, phraseology you want to use for that but it wasn't for me that wasn't the case he came to me <laughs> because all, all the things that I thought okay if one day I become one of these good Christians <laughs> one of the things uh, the things I won't do is I won't give up my drinking with my mates <laughs> and and uh, I won't change my my attitude towards uh, how I love or don't love people. You know, it's my choice who I want to like and who I don't want to like. <laughs> and uh, literally overnight, John, that, that thing changed. You know, from that, that, that voice that I heard, um, the next morning I called the first pastor I could find in a little Zanin newspaper. And the guy came over, you know, and I kind of explained my life to him. And he said, well, it's pretty clear, you know, you need to submit your life to, to God. And I, I kind of knew what that meant, John, because, uh, you know, my mom and dad were, were believers and my, my, my brother was. And I kind of fought it, you know, just saying I didn't need it. So there's no doubt to me uh, when I look back now. And, and I can't say I was over it then either, John, but I was definitely suffering from PTSD. And, you know, I know God don't want to talk about it, and it's a hard thing to talk about. Um, but, you know, I, I think for me, admitting it and understanding that uh, I could not handle it on my own was a massive step forward for me, you know, because when I realized that and I realized, you know, because I am a person that I, I tend to do things myself, you know. So I think I said in the last interview, um, 
I fly by the seat of my pants, you know, so I'm not very good when it comes to working in organizations <laughs> because I don't like the, the structure of that. You know, it's funny because as a pilot, you have to have structure. But there's another side of me that, uh, you know, I like the freedom of um, exploring and, and doing my own thing. So, But recognizing that I did need other people in my life was a massive, massive change for me. So, And, and that decision, um, John, changed absolutely everything about my life. You know, I was still the same, Ray. So um, in terms of, you know, uh, I'll come to it later, John, but, you know, I eventually wrote a book about my life, um, which is kind of two halves of my life. And the first half was my, almost my pre-divine um, intervention, if I can call it that. Um, and then the one is uh, post that. And people that know me from when I was in the Air Force or playing rugby in Rhodesia and Pretty much, um, they know me as the same Ray. They, you know, some of them are not quite sure because <laughs> they've heard I've gone religious. Um, and uh, and then when we go to a party and I have a couple of beers with them, then I think, okay, so you drink beer, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my perception of how I live my faith is probably different to, you know, the norm of what people are expecting. So um, I, I, I fully love my God and I, I do everything every single day to honor him, but to, to be me, you know. So um, there was a radical change in my life, but I'm still the same Ray inside, you know. It's like, um, so it's been wonderful because, uh, you know, as time has gone on, uh, people that knew me from the past, um, first of all, they would say, you know, um, they can't believe that same naughty bugger Ray <laughs> <laughs> from the school and the Air Force uh, uh, had become a missionary, you know. But uh, and then the people that know me as a mission you can't believe that I was a naughty little bugger when I was small you know <laughs> but as I say you know the fundamental things have not changed but uh, obviously my faith has you know and that that decision uh, led to um, me literally going back to East London and dating my wife all over again John you know so it was quite a humbling experience you know because I'd go and knock on the door of, of uh, where my wife lived which my, was my old house and my little six-year-old daughter would come to the door and she'd say to me dad what do you want <laughs> <laughs> and I said no, I've come to take your mom out and, and she said what well, mom said you've got to wait here <laughs> <laughs> so it was it really was a humbling thing you know to have to so we literally dated all over again you know and um, went through the whole process and and, and then, you know, got to a place where we realized, no, we actually, she she saw a radical change in me, John. Um, uh, I, I did decide at that stage, well, you know, I kind of felt compelled to stop the drinking because I was still playing rugby. And um, and it was not because drink is bad, but for me it was, you know, because um, I, I would just like, uh, you know, come home two, three o'clock in the morning on a motorbike, you know, after having been in the pub for, you know, six hours after the game. And, uh, you know, we would think, ah, oh, that's no problem. <laughs> Until I came off the bike. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so anyway, so then, you know, then we got remarried. And our, our second marriage was very different to the first in that it was much less formal. So my first marriage, you know, I had the whole God of Honor thing, you know, all my mates, and uh, it was very formal. I had my uniform on, looked great in pictures. <laughs> but the, the the words that I said the first time around didn't really mean much to me, to be honest, compared to the second time around. You know, when I said, you know, for better, for worse, um, you know, all of that stuff that we say, it, uh, I realized the second time I wasn't just saying it to my wife, but I was saying it to to the, the one that created me. And so that radically changed my whole, um, uh, you know, sorts of what I was going to be doing. And in a very short time after that, so I moved back in with my wife. My kids were completely confused. Uh, my six-year-old would go to school and tell her teacher that her mom and dad just got married. <laughs> so, so we'd have to explain to the teacher exactly what happened, you know, so... Yeah, and, and not long after that, John, I, I actually, you know, because I didn't have a job, you know, so when I moved back to my wife, um, I got a job through a, a guy from church, you know, who got me a job as an insurance broker consultant. Uh, 
And so I wasn't selling insurance, but I was selling my company to the broker. And um, and I started doing very well at that, you know. And uh, we bought our first house uh, in East London. And um, sorry, uh, but then we moved to Port Elizabeth. And, you know, swimming pool, uh, uh, three bedrooms, two cars, you know. So, so and I think everybody else thought, okay, this guy's got his life together now. You know? it's like, especially my in laws, you know, my in laws were not happy with me divorcing the, the only daughter, you know, and um, and they were Swiss as well. So, um, anyway, yeah, so we got back together and uh, and uh, started a whole different kind of life. And within three years, John, or actually 18 months of being back together, I felt a calling on my life, you know, to, and that's the only way I can describe it, to, to, to give up what I was doing in terms of the insurance and go and serve other people, you know, so, um, I, to, I, I I didn't have the courage, John, to tell my wife. <laughs> I thought, yeah, I've messed this woman around. And, uh, you know, now we've got back together. We've got everything that kind of looks like we're successful. And uh, now I'm going to tell her that we're going to leave all of that behind, you know, and 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 stepping up our faith that meant that we were not going to get paid a salary, John, you know, so it was completely by faith. Um but fortunately, I didn't tell her. And what happened is uh, she came to me one day and she said she felt like uh, uh, God said to her, we're going to be leaving this house. And I just think, hallelujah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. so so what happened is I resigned my job. Um, we, we knew, John, uh, because our, our church kind of agreed that, you know, we were the first actual missionaries to go out from the church. And they agreed that they would try and support us. And we're on, the, on the strength of 250 rand, that was in 1984, we took a step out and we joined an organization called Youth with a Mission. And some, I know you know of it, as a few of our viewers may know that. And, and uh, John, it led me into a, a life completely foreign to anything I'd done before, you know. And it was literally, what I loved about it is uh, why we're an organization that literally say, you've got a vision for something, go and do it. And that suited me down to the ground, you know. So I'll never forget sitting in the mountains of, of the little country of Lesotho right up in the mountains, you know, in the snow, uh, looking down <laughs> at these villages and all these people and thinking, you know, and I literally just put my hand up, John, and I just said, okay, here I am, you know, send me, um, not knowing what that meant. And it led into a, a life the next um, literally 35 years of um, uh, serving in Southern Africa with this mission. Um and with my wife alongside me, who was, you know, <laughs> I, I have to applaud my wife, uh, John. It's the same as, you know, when we were in Rhodesia, I think, you know, I don't think we realized how much, how important our wives were in the whole scheme of things that happened in Rhodesia. You know, I think people are acknowledging it now, but at the time, you know, we kind of just got on with it and, you know, expected them to get on with it. But, uh, you know, we've got some amazing women that have come out of Rhodesia, you know, that um, have went through so much and have been a backbone of of our success, you know. So she kind of said, okay, let's do it, you know, and off we went into missions, you know. <laughs> and and it led us to some amazing stuff, John. You know, I got to literally travel the world um, with no salary. You know, this is the amazing thing about it is that every month we were living by faith and we, we did not know how much money we were going to get at the end of the month. And we didn't have a budget because it was pointless having a budget, you know. It's just like what whatever we've got, we live on that. <laughs> it's like... But I got to go all over the world, you know, and uh, and uh, John, I'm, I, I think it's important as well is that not, I'm not an out and out preacher. <laughs> I talk a lot, as you can see, <laughs> but I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a great believer in forcing my faith or what I believe on other people, you know. So um, what I do is I, I fully believe in the person I read about in the Bible. That is the the core of of what I believe, and I kind of looked at what he did. 
And I try and follow that and, and try and follow that example. I don't like politics that come sometimes with church or institutionalized religion and things like that. But I just kind of look and say, okay, what did he do? Uh, you know, how can I do something like that? And, um, and but the basic of all of that is love, John, you know, so, um, you know, to, to, to go from, uh, this is what I think people find quite extraordinary about my, my journey and, and the book that I wrote is that to go from being a fighter pilot in the Rhodesian Air Force as a young man and, and then, you know, transition to something like this where we ended up actually founding a care center in this tiny country of Lesotho that had literally been forgotten because it's stuck in the middle of South Africa, you know, like, and when the AIDS pandemic hit our, our, our continent, uh, Lesotho was literally forgotten. And um, we ended up, uh, and it was really my wife's uh, compassion that she reached out to five babies that were in the hospital that were HIV positive, and um, they were not being looked after by the staff because uh, they kind of thought, well, they're positive anyway, they're going to die. And there were no antiretrovirals. So, you know, again, my wife just couldn't walk past that. <laughs> so she started to go to the hospital and uh, um, with our daughter and uh, start um, literally cleaning the babies, feeding them and uh, looking after them. So out of that, we then eventually took the babies out of the hospital and started in a tiny building. It was a one room uh, building because uh, that's all we could afford and uh, and and five beds and took these five babies out or five cots you know little cots that we've been given and and John that started uh, 10 years of an incredible thing that happened you know in our lives um, because um, uh, I always have this phrase it's good that he only shows you the first step <laughs> <laughs> because uh, for us it was okay we can look after five babies you know? um, and uh, yeah so we did that and then uh, ten, 10 years later John we'd, we'd um, and when I say we you know all we did is we just uh, obeyed and we just out of love said okay let's look after those five um, and in the 10 years we built an 18 million rand care centre with 12 buildings um, uh, um baby houses, we had a clinic, we had a, um, a creche, a preschool, we employed our own um, social worker, our own nurse, and that was with no money, John. <laughs> I'm not kidding, you know, this is a, an amazing story in that we literally just said this, we want this to be the best place we could make possible for these children. And uh, if people see pictures of it, and I can actually put a website for those that are interested. I know some people may not be in this type of thing, but there may be some that are, you know, and 20 years later, John, that place is still thriving. And by the time we left after 10 years, we, we'd rescued 350 babies that literally had been thrown down pit latrines, left in riverbeds, left on taxis. And uh, and again, you know, for me to say that, John, you know, that's if somebody had said, okay, what are you going to do for the next 30 years of your life? That would not have been part of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was, you know, so obviously it changed a lot of who I am. Um, and, and what it's done for me, John, and even in the project that I'm involved in now, it's just the value of life. Um, you know, I've got such a new sense of that, you know, that every single person's life is important. And all of us not only have a story, but we all are a story, you know. And uh, for those people that, um, and I know there are people out there, because, you know, I've come across many in my own uh, desperation and depression, you know, because I was, I was in severe depression, Um in that, I've come across many others like that as well. And um, and recognizing that and realizing, you know, that each one of us is here for a purpose. You know, we all have something that we've been gifted with that we're supposed to be using, you know, to, to share with others and uplift others. And so, yeah, so that's kind of, um, yeah. I, 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 sorry, John, the one thing, I, last thing I want to mention with that is that, um, so uh, we had three children of our own, um, we had all grown up and left home. Uh, we got to a point we were actually at 60 babies in our care center and we developed a staff of 60 <laughs> and uh, we had this big care center. So I actually became a manager, you know, um, I was no more the, 
the the pioneer and starting all up, which that part I love, but I didn't like being a manager anymore, you know. And um, uh, yeah, so we were looking after all of this, and I, I realized that eight years, you know, this um, this is not for me anymore, you know, because I um, I don't like all the hassles that come with being a manager. And anyway, so um, at that time, my wife then approached me and said to me, um, you know, we've got no more children; they've all left home. So I said. What do you mean? We're looking after 60 children. <laughs> and she said, no, we've got no children at home. You know, so I thought, you know, praise the Lord. <laughs> but uh, anyway, out of that, we decided, um, uh, that's it's 18 years ago now, John, we decided to adopt two of the girls that had come through our center that was called Beautiful Gates. And we adopted these two girls. They weren't biological sisters, but both came from tragic backgrounds, you know? So um, we ended up adopting those two girls. And so they um, they now, right now, they're still living with us. Um, the one is in matric and the other one uh, um, left school at 15 uh, because of some difficulties she had. And she's an incredible artist and now um, is set to go back this is the full circle thing, John. Is she said to go back to the very place where she she was one of the first five that we started looking after, and she's looking at going back to volunteer there as an art teacher with these little kids. You know that you know because for me it just you know, it's it's it was such an important part of our life as well. And to see full circle for this uh, lovely young lady, you know, going back and going to serve now where she came from. You know, so so yeah. So John, obviously, you know, my world got turned upside down, you know, and uh, we, we, I'm, I'm so thankful, you know, because my, not only did my wife and I get repatriated, and uh, so that was in 1984, so um, when people ask us, you know, how long have you been married, um, I tell them it's been 43 years on and off, <laughs> <laughs> and that's obviously because of that little gap, you know, it was nine months, we, it wasn't separated, you know, we were actually divorced for nine months, and then we got back together, and and, you know, so since then, we've obviously now had five children because we adopted the two. And we've got six grandkids now. And um, and we still, uh, it's never been a big uh, a priority for me, you know. So um, I know, you know, some of my mates have gone on to do extremely well and rightfully so, you know, they, they've done very well in their careers. Uh, but I've, I've always kind of lived day by day, you know, and I'm still doing that today. Um, so, uh, but I wouldn't change a thing, you know, yeah, uh, if yeah. I look back, uh, sometimes I don't think we actually make the choices uh, that we make of life, you know, we think mm -hmm. we're making choices and then they get kind of sideswiped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You wrote this autobiography, you've mentioned that, um, and I'll put a picture up so that everyone can see that. Um, sure. Maybe. And then you ended up in Cape Town and at the age of 62, becoming a tour guide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and now you're involved in, a, in a, also a very interesting thing, which, which aligns closely with what I'm doing. Um, so perhaps you can tell us a bit about that. Yeah, because, um, you know, after, after 10 years of running, uh, founding and running Beautiful Gate, you know, I, as I said, I knew my time was up at eight years, but we had to wait two years to find the right people to take over, you know, because it, obviously it was very dear to us and uh, there was a lot of money invested and a lot of lives invested with the children. Uh, and fortunately, there was a couple that came from America that had kind of come as volunteers or the wife had uh, just to come and see the place and uh, they fell in love with it, you know, and um, the two of them with their three children decided to come and serve with us and, uh, um a bit before the time that they would have liked, <laughs> they had to take over, you know, and it was partially because, you know, I'd, I'd literally, both of us, uh, my wife and I had got quite burnt out, you know, after 10 years of trying to pioneer something like that in a country like Kisutu. Um, I won't even try and go into that. So there's a lot of joy in what we did. Hard graft and... Um, yeah, John, I, one thing I wanted to say with that, you know, that I often used to look back and think, you know, why Why did it take me so long to respond to God? And was all of that that I experienced in the Air Force and in growing up in Rhodesia, was that a waste of time? 
<laughs> but I realized in, in running what we were running, I needed all of that, uh, John, all of that fortitude, that perseverance, that fuss by never give up that we were taught in the, in the, in the defense force. I needed all of that with starting a, a care center for babies. I would never have imagined it, you know, but um, anyway, so yeah, after 10 years, you know, we were both pretty burnt out and um, we both, um, um, always loved Cape Town and we thought, well, let's go to Cape Town. I knew I couldn't retire. Uh, so I think a lot of people thought I had retired because, you know, I was, um, uh, I was 56 at the time. And I think they thought I'd taken early retirement and, uh, but <laughs> that wasn't the case. I'd actually moved to Cape Town with a desire, funnily enough, to help people to walk in their passion. You know, because I'm a great believer that I think people should find what their strengths are. You know, no, we all know we have weaknesses. And I think I mentioned this uh, in the last interview. Uh, but don't concentrate on those things. Be aware of them. But find your strengths and go and do that. You know, find your sweet spot and work in your sweet spot. You know, and you, you're going to be happy doing what you're doing anyway because you're naturally drawn to it. Um, so anyway, so that's what I was going to do. But um, we both realized, John, that we were actually worse off than we thought, you know, and um, in terms of uh, uh, psychologically and just uh, uh, fatigue, uh, we were both really fatigued, you know. So I, I started to look around and start looking. I applied for jobs and... Um, uh, it was quite difficult finding a job, uh, even though we'd done what we'd done, John. You know, it wasn't didn't kind of fit any criteria unless you could find another NGO that you could work in. You know, so so I just did my normal thing and just started to look for what else can I do and create out of who I am. <laughs> so, so it was a bit of a journey trying different things. And then, yeah, as as um, you know, I, I became very good friends with the guy that was a life coach. And um, I, I said to him one day, you know, D Dave, I think I'd love to become a life coach, you know, because I've got all this life experience. I love people. I want to help people. And he said, Ray, he said, oh, you, you're a great guy. And he said, uh, I've got to know you really well. He said, but I've got bad news for you. You won't make a very good life coach. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of devastated me a bit. And I said, why, Dave? And he said, because you talk too much, pal. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so you know, life coaches apparently are supposed to uh, listen a lot, you know, and um, <laughs> so that's not a, it's not a strength of mine. <laughs> so anyway, he said, but you know what, Ray, he said, I think you'd make a great tour guide. And uh, so that kind of led me into investigating that. And, and John, you know, for guys that don't know this, you know, to become a tour guide, you know, I thought, yeah, no, that sounds a great idea because I love telling stories. I love my country and showing it to people. But there was way more to it than that. You know, I mean, you've got to go and do a course and then you've got to pay for that as well. And uh, and then you've also got a, um, um, they call it a portfolio of evidence. It's like a, a file like this where you've got to prove to them that you found out enough about the country that you are um, competent. That's the word that they use to, to act as a guide. And then the worst of all of it, John, is that at the end of it all, we had to do a three hour closed book exam on all the stuff we'd learned. And, and you know, John, I was like 62. And I, at the night before the exam, I went to my wife and I said to her, uh, I don't think I'm going to go write this exam. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, my brain, I'm telling you, it was frazzled, man. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, she said, listen, if you could fly an airplane, surely you could do this. <laughs> So the, the next day I went to wrote it, and I actually did very well. You know, I got like over 90% or something. Anyway, so I became a tour guide, John, and it was it was an incredible experience, you know, because, um, uh, yeah, I got to meet so many people from all over the world, you know, and 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 what my, my, my whole outlook on life was that, you know, I want to share my life with other people, not necessarily, you know, trying to convert them to anything that I believe, but, you know, just sharing with them the excitement and, and passion that I have about the life that I'm living, you know. So um, most times tourists, when they come, they, they, they like to hear a few of the facts, but they don't actually want that so much. They want the stories, you know. So it led right into 
who I am, you know, that I love stories, you know, as I said earlier, you know, so I got to tell stories to people about our country and about myself. And, and it led to a lot of friendships, John, you know, so I've got people all over the world, you know, not just from my Air Force days and, uh, but yeah, from my guardian, you know, um, and so, yeah, that was a really good fit for me. I, it just got a bit tiring, John, because, you know, I was up at five o'clock in the morning and I'm not an early morning person. <laughs> it's like I'm a night, night owl, you know, but sometimes, you know, you can be up at five and then if it's if it's a, a group that want to go to supper as well, you'd be with them the whole day and you're literally just giving out, you know, for hours and, and then you take them back to the hotel and then pick them up again, take them for dinner. And then you'd sometimes be getting home like half past 11, 12 o'clock at night and then up five the next morning again. You know, so it was it was quite tiring. Uh, but and I was trying to kind of space out my work a bit, but um, but then obviously COVID hit. Um and you know that changed everything for the tourist industry. You know, I mean it's decimated the tourist industry and I know thousands. I mean, you know, in Cape Town alone, there are four thousand tour guides. I mean, people probably don't realize it of tourists, you know, that are coming. So it's not easy to find jobs. Um, and anyway, so, yeah, so, so many guys have lost their jobs. Now, obviously, it's starting to change now, but it takes a long time to get back in again. So in the meantime, when that all happened, I then uh, joined a non-government organization uh, that was also Christian uh, based uh, that was reaching out to students that were coming from America and kind of giving them introduction to what life was like in South Africa. Um, and and because of my experience living in Lesotho and having two girls that um, most of their friends are from the township, you know, so um, uh, I knew the township pretty well, you know, so when teams came, I could go and take them, not just to see all the beautiful places in Cape Town, but go and see the, see the reality of what life is like for a lot of South Africans you know, living there as well. So, uh, yeah, so I did that for you. And then, as I say, COVID hit and then I was retrenched. So um, uh, so I've been retrenched for 18 months, you know. So, <laughs> so it was kind of hard, you know, because, again, we didn't have like a savings to fall back on. You know, literally we were living day by day. But um, uh, I, I don't want to dwell on that, John, because, you know, all I can say is, you know, we've been able to survive, you know, over the last 18 months. But in the midst of that, uh, and this is probably the, the 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 highlight of where we're going, you know, with this is that um, it led me back to my roots, John. That's the only way I can describe it, you know, because when I talk to people about um, their stories and writing books, because I'm a great proponent of telling people, write your stories, you know, put them down because one day you're gone, you know, and that's why I wrote mine, because I knew nothing at all about my grandparents at all. I just knew my grandfather came from Norway and he was in the Merchant Navy. That's it. You know, so uh, so that's partially why I wrote the book, so that my kids would know something about my life, where I came from, you know, how mom and dad got back together and, you know, how you were part of the family. So I'm a great believer in that, that people should write that down. And um, and through that, um, I got, a, got reintroduced to the Flame Lily Foundation. Um, you know, which is very active here in Cape Town. But most of the folk uh, that are part of that are, are much older than me, John. You know, so, you know, I think I'm getting old. But, you know, we've got some really old dears that are in their 90s that are still religiously go to those meetings, you know. And, um, and I love being around them, you know, because they've got such happy memories of life there. And they don't kind of delve on you know, what's happened there, but all they remember is the good times that they had there, you know, and and um, it's great to be around them. So, um, and then um, about 18 months ago, I ended up, you know, Neil Jackson, I know you know Neil well, and um, he became a very good friend of mine. Um, I actually met him as a cadet. We, uh, we, we got uh, picked, the Air Force and the RLI we were put together in a soccer team that we had to play against the Barter professional team in Guela because they, their game had got cancelled. So they quickly put us cadets together and we played in this game. And, and at halftime, we were, we were leading 3-0. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we were in our Barter tackies and in our, you know, RLI and Air Force, uh, you know, PT clothes. And <laughs> 
So anyway, yeah, so I met him and obviously I met him again, you know, during the war out in the bush. And But then we lost contact. And then, you know, 35 years later, again, through intervention, you know, we, we came to know each other. And then, you know, 18 months ago, sadly, Neil passed away. And so I went to his uh, memorial and it just happened to be the same weekend that they were having a memorial for Op Uric and, you know, for the, the Puma 164 crash. And, uh, and you know, John, there was something that that kind of broke in me and that's the only way I can describe it. You know, it's like, I think people may think I've gone all soft <laughs> and I think maybe I have, you know, I think there's there's been a softening that's happened in my life, but um, um uh, that broke me, you know, just to, re- to remember again how much so many laid down, you know, for, for what we believed in, you know, and it really sparked an interest in me about the idea that we should not forget about our country. And, you know, we are the last of the Rhodesians. You know, there is a time when I talk to my son, who's now 42, you know, he he he's, he cannot believe that I'm still meeting with my mates and get, having these get-togethers where guys come from all over the world 45 years later. You know, he said, Dad, I'll never have relationships like that. You know, so what we had was unique, you know. So it's almost like treasuring that and being able to pass it on to our generations, you know, even though they don't always want to listen to us, a day will come that they'll open that book and they'll read that stuff and then they'll realize, oh, so this is who my dad was and this is, you know, the life he was part of. And um, so, yeah, so through that, you know, my, my interest in us as Rhodesians and and realizing as well, John, that for a lot of people, I mean, this has come through, you know, I started a Facebook group and probably this is what I should have got to a long time ago. <laughs> But I started this Facebook group called Rhodesia's Untold Stories. Um, And it started with literally a few people, a handful of people that said to me, you know, it would be great to be able to have a place where we can tell our stories, where we know people will not think we're lying, first of all, and will understand. They'll have empathy because they've been through it as well, you know. So, so yeah, so I came up with this idea and thought, okay, let me start a Facebook page and – so, yeah, so I did that five months ago, um, and I always had the intention from the start, uh, uh, John, when I look back at my first um, interview, if you want to call it that, or my first announcement to people that came onto the group, I've kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, tagged it at the top. So anybody that comes into the group now, it's the first thing they see, is that from the beginning, I had an intention that uh, a book would be written from these stories that people are telling on the site. Um, so that's what I've been working on. And we, we pretty close now to the actual compiling of it. In in fact, you know, the editing has been done and what's, what's amazing, John, is that, um, I've got like a small team of volunteers that are helping part-time where they can, that are all people that I had not met before until I started the group. And then they kind of put their hand up and say, well, I can help with this. I can help with that. And and it's been phenomenal, you know, just uh, again, it just kind of cemented for me again, this whole thing of who we were as Rhodesians, you know, it's like, I've got your back, you know, it's like, so I, I uh, and, and people have often referred to this book as uh, my story or my book. And I keep telling people, this is not, this is our book, you know, and it's going to, it's compiled of hundreds of stories of people that have told stories on the site, you know, so uh, it's been such a pleasure, John, and, and to meet people online. And, and, you know, I think for me, the most um, treasured feedback of all of it is that people have said, thank you so much for creating a place that we can feel the freedom to share our stories. And I've I've had a number of people, John, that have written stories that are going to be in the book that they said they've never told anybody the story ever before. So, you know, so that thrills me because uh, I think we've been quietened by the world around us and politics and, you know, just the, the, the trend that the world is going, um, they don't really want to hear about this stuff, you know, and, and what, uh, why, we, why we did what we did and what we were defending and um, all of that kind of thing. So for me, it's a great opportunity, yeah. I believe um, Craig Bone uh, painted the cover of your book. Yeah, that, 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 that's the other uh, great thing that's happened, John, is that, you know, uh, I, I've been blown away, seriously. I mean, it's like, you know, there, there are a number of artists and photographers that have joined the group and, uh, and uh, exquisite 
artists, you know, with amazing talents. And Craig Bowen obviously is very well known in military circles. And uh, for those that don't know Craig, you know, he's he's an incredible human being. You know, he's he's in your face. So <laughs> yeah, it's typical typical RL, you know. It's like <laughs> but but uh, he he's a wonderful man, you know. And if you really follow what he's doing, you know, he's he's donated so much to so many causes, you know, and he's got a real heart to help other people and things like that. And he's an exquisite artist, you know. So um, I dared to ask him, you know, and I don't know Craig that well. I didn't really know him in the in the war. I've read his book, um, which blew me away as well, you know, gave me a great insight um, as well as to what life was like, you know, for the guys on the ground, you know. Um, and and so, um, yeah, so I, I dared to approach him, you know, and uh, in his normal cocky Craig... Uh, <laughs> Now, he he didn't respond, but the next minute uh, he asked me a, a very pertinent question, which was amazing. They said to me, when you flew the links, can you remember which side uh, weapons you used first? And I thought, what a strange question. You know, and I had to think back, you know, what I, I can't remember if I had a preference. Anyway, what it, I, I, then I realized that generally it was the right, the, the, the um, starboard side. So I told him that, you know, and, I, and that's it. That was the end of the conversation. And then a couple of weeks later, he said to me, oh, by the way, there's a gift on its way to you. And what had happened is he'd, he'd auctioned a beautiful piece um, of a riverbank in the Zambezi. Uh, and the the, the uh, money from that went to Madala Trust, you know, the the. the Pension is in Zimbabwe. And the guy that uh, actually won the auction, he lives in Cape Town. So Craig was going to send him that. Uh, painting and then and he slipped in another one for me and that painting uh, was uh, of a lynx uh, pulling out of a, a dive um, after throwing a front end with the right front end missing yeah. so I realized why he asked me the question you know so anyway yeah, so out of that you know then I kind of gained confidence to to be a bit more bold with Craig and I said to him you know um, do you think you could look at doing our book cover and and we kind of between the two of us you know he asked well what do you want on it you know so you know and again I think a lot of people like the the cover I chose for the Facebook group it's a it's a beautiful uh, picture uh, by a lady by the name of Frankie K who's also a very well-known photographer in Zim, you know, and um, so that's the, the the cover for the Facebook page. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I, I wanted something a little bit different for the book, you know, and uh, when you see the cover, you know, it's basically a, a guy and, and uh, his partner, whether it's his wife or girlfriend, uh, but he's standing at a tree with Matusa Donna in the background and two elephants and a sunset, and uh, if the people look carefully, there's a, an FN rifle lying next to him, um, and he's writing in a journal, and it's at a campfire, you know, it's, it's, it kind of caught everything that I wanted in us telling stories, you know, of that time, so, yeah, you're right, I mean, I'm very privileged, and, you know, when the book comes out, uh, there's a number of pictures and paintings that uh, these these uh, folk have allowed me to use, um, you know, without any payment or anything like that in the book. So, mm. yeah, so it's going to add a lot of value to the book in terms of what people are actually going to be getting, you know, when they get it. Gee, Ray, it's been quite amazing listening to you because I have, in a way, uh, gone through a similar experience with the whole COVID thing is that uh, my main source of income uh, after I left stockbroking uh, was teaching martial arts. And um, okay. with, with the hard lockdown, we weren't allowed to gather. We weren't allowed to. Um, and I, a lot of my students uh, are young uh, university graduates with PhDs or whatever. They decided to use that opportunity to, to move overseas and okay, do yeah. doctoral work overseas and I lost about a third of my students to to who took the gap overseas and I lost about another third of my students who, who just decided it wasn't worth the risk um, yeah, of, yeah. Co of COVID and everything um, and now that um, <clears throat> things are coming back to normal and people are vaccinated and whatever or have had COVID and they've recovered uh, I, I'm left with about a third of the students I used to have and I, I literally wouldn't be able to survive on that on that reduced income you know um and, yeah, and it was it was during that 
time of lockdown and everything that I taught myself to make videos, you know, <laughs> a bit like yeah, you know, yeah. to become a tour guide. And uh, exactly. I, I didn't, I was always interested in photography, but I had absolutely no idea how to make a video or a movie, you know, yeah. and, yeah. Uh, and it's so, it's just so great to be able to use that uh, downtime to learn new skills. And, um, and I also had that passion to, I didn't have your gift for uh, writing, um, uh, it's a bit like in music. I, I love playing the guitar and I love my music, hmm. but I can't I can't really sing, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, um, but um, but I've been able to put this video making thing to good use, and unfortunately, uh, our channel's monetized now, and so I get a couple of extra hundred dollars from YouTube, yeah. and that you know that kind of helps me to survive, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and and it's. And it's also just recording the, the untold stories of, of Rhodesia. And I, even though I was in the army, I've learned so much about stuff, oh, cool. you know, like, um, you know, I've got a newfound respect for the sappers. I never knew they did so much important stuff. Yeah. And, you know, and I've met, uh, you know, just such wonderful people. And, uh, um, but uh, Ray, thank you so much for your time today. And it's uh, been fascinating. Um, just so everyone knows, um, We've included in the description of this video, so if you're watching the video, if you just scroll down, you'll see there's a, a description. In the description of the video, you'll be able to see how to get hold of Ray's books that he's uh, writing. And uh, and so if you want to obtain those books, or if you want to obtain any of Hannes' books, uh, please just look in the description of the video and there'll be a link there for you to follow. Ray, I think that's about it, eh? Fantastic, John. I, I really appreciate the opportunity, you know, and uh, yeah. my, my closing thing to anybody that's watching is, you know, tell your stories, guys, before it's too late, you know, it's like, um, uh, we, you don't want that, that is going to go to your grave with you, you know, so we, there, there are plenty of platforms like this now uh, that it can be done, you know, so, and and I think the site is on there as well. So, John, if, if people are interested in going over to that untold story site because uh, of a facebook page uh because this is definitely not going to be the, f the only book you know I, yeah, at yeah, the yeah. beginning i thought am i going to be able to put a book together yeah. and uh there's no doubt there's going to be more than one you know so yeah, sure. the stories need to be told yeah, yeah so thank sure. you john amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me